Following the introduction of the Berkut, Vina, Volkhov and Nova Air Defense Systems, the rapid arms development of the Cold War didn't slow even a bit. New threats to the air defense of the Soviet Union emerged on the horizon. In 1960, the Mark II-capable strategic bomber, the B-58 Hustler, reached initial operation capability. In the mid-60s, the XB-7 Valkyrie, a Mark III-capable strategic bomber, performed its first flight. Dealing with these threats would have been very challenging or even impossible for mentioned air defense systems if they perform electronic jamming. Mark II or even Mark III capable large and long range missiles appeared in the inventory of the B 52 Intercontinental Bomber as well as the English V bombers. This could be launched outside of the engagement zone of existing Soviet SAM systems. Such missiles were the AGM 28 Hound Dog and the English Blue Steel and later the AGM 96 SRAM. The task was destroying such high speed targets from as far away as possible. The appearance of these threats in the early and mid 60s seemed likely. For this reason, a new air defense system was specified which would be able to provide adequate response to several threats at the same time but with a completely new way and approach. Because of the relatively short range of the previously presented air defense systems, providing omnidirectional defense for an objective or a large city was not easy. It needed lots of SAM sites to form a defensive ring around them. Against these new kind of threats, this approach was not an option because it would be insanely costly and inefficient. Fortunately, high speed targets mean that they are flying at very high altitude, at least at 10 km or even higher, up to about 20 km. At the time of the development, only in the very thin atmosphere was it possible to reach and hold speeds of Mach 2 or higher for a prolonged period with any type of missile or manned airplane. Thanks to the attack profile of threats, the interceptor missile also could fly long distance at a very high altitude with a relatively low drag. Therefore, if a sufficiently large missile can climb to 20 km or above, then accelerate, it can have a very large kinematic range using a semi-ballistic trajectory in the thin atmosphere. A large and fast missile can provide area defense capability against high-speed targets if other elements of the SAM system provide the other necessary features. The new SAM system was designed to have a range of at least 150 km as per the design specifications. The next issue on the list was the guidance of the new missile. The basic principle of radio command guidance is that both the target and the missile must be tracked by the guidance station which guides the missile. The measurement error, on the other hand, increases with the distance. At the specified 150 km maximum engagement range, the margin of error would be so large that it made the use of this control method impossible with a conventional warhead. It could only have been used if every missile had a nuclear warhead. Therefore, a new type of guidance was needed that was much more precise, preferably quasi-independent from the engagement distance. The new S-200 air defense system was developed under the leadership of Raspertin, who was also the chief designer of the S-75 and S-125 systems in the Key B-1 design bureau. A little spoiler here, a member of the S-200 family eventually became the longest range land-based air defense missile system with a conventional warhead during the Cold War. It retained this title until the appearance of the S-400 system and with its 40N-6 missile which happened many decades later. How did they succeed? From the specification, the parameters described earlier arose the need of a much larger system, a gigantic one, the king of all SAMs. The commander of the Homeland Air Defense at the time expressed his need in a vivid way, explaining how large an air defense system the Soviet homeland must be. The advantage of a long-range SAM system is that, if additional technical requirements are fulfilled, it is suitable for area defense, no matter if the target flies at Mach 2 or even Mach 3. The objects and cities to be protected omnidirectionally needed a SAM ring around them as was done with the S-25 Berkov around Moscow or with the Dvina and Volkhov sites around other larger cities. The issue with this kind of system is that SAM batteries on opposite sides of an attack had no use at all. This was especially true for the S-25 Berkut, where the location of the site and the engagement zone was static. 
This is not the case if a SAM system has a 150 km large engagement zone or even larger and the target channels provided by the missile batteries are available at any direction. Let's imagine a SAM system with a 150 km engagement zone and 6 missile batteries are deployed around the big city, each with a single target channel. This is similar to the deployment of the S-75 Volkhov. Even if the attack happens on the other side of the city, any of the long-range SAM battery can engage. The difference in the protected zone is small if we consider SAM batteries on the other side of the city. As the engagement zone increases, the difference simply becomes meaningless. This leads to the conclusion that if a long-range missile is available with a usable long-range guidance system, the missile batteries can be deployed to the same location. They are able to provide literally the same level protection as the other formations. With a sum of 200-250 km engagement zone, it simply does not matter on which side of our city is it. With this setup, a long-range SAM is able to protect not only the city itself, but countless other cities and objects nearby. Compared to this long-range SAM setup, the S-75 Volkhov would need 6 target channels in each direction and 36 batteries would be needed. Even with such an insane number of units, we could not speak about error defense. What is the technical content and physics behind the system? To fully understand this, a deeper presentation of the physics of radars would be essential. This part is skipped, maybe it will be discussed later for those who are more deeply interested in the topic. A part of them is explained in the extra content. Even if the physical principles, the why, cannot be understood or not presented here, its consequences must be known as facts. The operation of the S-200 system cannot be understood without them. This video, therefore, explains only the effect and consequences of the operating modes, which are necessary for understanding the target illuminator radar, but not the why and how. So far in the video series, the radars of the given system were presented first, then finally the composition of the missile battery and its main equipment. This time it is happening in reverse, because the S-200 has different structure and organization compared to the rest of stems. Let's introduce the term, the sight and missile battery. One S-200 missile battery has a single target channel, it can engage only a single target at a time. The core of the missile battery consists of the target illuminator radar, the missile launchers with missiles and other support equipment of the missile battery. Compared to all of previous SAMs, the missile batteries of the S-200 were deployed at least in pair at a single site. Sites with three missile batteries also were common either, in addition to some S-200 sites with five missile batteries. This is the consequence of what was explained just some minutes ago. From an operational and maintenance point of view, it is simpler to deploy the missile batteries and the technical battery in one place. The engagement zone covers enough large area to provide almost omnidirectional defense considering a city and its vicinity because the target channels can be allocated to any direction. The S-200 system, because of its very large and heavy missiles, the large and heavy radars and extensive support needs is essentially a static system. It is not possible to deploy on the field as was possible with the Dvina, Volkhov or Neva systems. Except one country, every missile battery had a single deployment site without any alternative location. More about this country and its options in the extra content. In 1967, the Soviet Union started building sites with five missile batteries, one of them was near Tallinn. Because of this, for a while the West referred to the S-200 as the Tallinn system. Likely because of financial reasons, after the first few sites were completed, the rest were built only to provide accommodation for two or three missile batteries. There was only a single site with four batteries, that exception is explained in the extra content. On the images we can see the layout of standardized sites with five, three and two missile batteries. These are idolized plot plans which were adjusted according to location of the exact site. The target illumination radars of the missile batteries were placed more than 1000 meters from the missile launchers. The target acquisition radar of the site was even farther. This provided a safe distance to avoid interfering with each other during operation. The shared equipment and buildings of the S-200 site, the missile storage, the assembly building, the missile transporter and other support equipment typically were the opposite side of the site. 
On the image we can see the remains of the first S200 site west from Tallinn between Nage and Turisali. Regardless decades of decay, the ramparts around the missile launchers are still visible as well the route of the roads and the railways. In Hungary the S200 Vega entered service in 1986 with a two missile battery site. The most widely used variant was the Vega and its export variant the Vega A, therefore I used this same site to present the S200 system. The shared equipment of the site is the following. P14F Oberona Talking B 360 degree scanning target acquisition radar. PRV17 Odd Pair Hackfinder radar. 5VR63 Microwave relay connection to the integrated air defense system, data link antenna system. K9M Battalion Management Center cabin. Equipment of the first and second missile batteries is the following. K1B, it consists the 5N62V target illumination radar and the K2V fire management cabin. K3V launch preparation cabin. Six pieces of 5P72V PU missile launchers per battery with a single missile. 12 5U24M ZM missile loaders per launcher each carrying one missile for a total of two reserve missiles per launcher. Each missile battery has one target illumination radar, but a site has only one long-range target acquisition radar and one high finder radar. The target acquisition radar is the P-14F Obrona NATO Code Talking B with an 11 meter height and 32 meter wide antenna. It can detect small fighters like a MiG-21 from about 300 kilometers. The maximum display detection range is 600 km. The Headfinder Reader is the PRV-70 NATO Code Odd Pair. It is similar in appearance to the PRV-13 used for the Dvina and Volhov missile batteries. It got significantly improved jamming protection thanks to the additional antennas. It measures the heights of the targets at a given azimuth angle, so only one target or flight could be measured at a time. Although both radars are installed on wheel chassis, it is clear from their size that neither can be called mobile. The P-14F is so large and heavy that it is necessary to secure it with bracing wires. The minimum dismantling and installation time of the system is approximately one day. This can be treated as a theoretical value because of the exception of Libya there was not any alternative site where any of the missile battery or the P-14F could be relocated. The cabins of the F-200 systems is the following. K9M Battalion Brigade Management Center cabin. The commander of the site assigns the targets from this cabin to the missile batteries using the data provided by the P14F and the PRV17 or what is forwarded and shared by the element of the integrated air defense systems. The site has a single K9M cabin. K2V Fire Management cabin. The crew of the target illumination radar, the RPC, is the battery commander, the guidance operators and the launch officer. The K2V cabin is below the K1V which is the 5N62V target illumination radar. Its NATO code is square pair. Every missile battery has one of these cabins. K3V launch preparation cabin. Loading and unloading is remotely controlled from here as well as the preparation process before the launch. Every missile battery has one K3V cabin. It has to be noted, regarding the target illumination radar, that non-standard deployment types existed. In some cases, a large platform was built with a ramp to it. This was not because of the effect of the radar horizon, but the environment of the surrounding area made it necessary. The site was erected in the middle of near a forest. It was far more convenient building a platform to put above the treetop level of the RPC than clearing a very large area of a forest. A site with two missile batteries occupied an area of 1.1 square kilometers, which is about 10 times higher compared to the S-75M Volkov system. The full crew of such an S-200 site with all operators, technicians, guards and logistics was nominally 600 men. The size of the crew show how complex the system was and the cost of maintenance and operation, not mentioning the acquisition cost of the S-200. The cost of a Vega site with two missile batteries was roughly identical to a setup with 10 Volkov missile batteries. 
The capabilities of the S200 were amazing at the time of its appearance, it is respectable even today, but the time has passed since. The general technology level of the S200 Vega was outdated even at the end of the Cold War. There is a strong relationship between the missile and guidance method, but let's begin with the guidance, then the target illuminator radar, and finally with the missile. Following these, the engagement zone, main features, and the limitations of the S200 system can be understood. In the late 50s and early 60s, only two guidance options were available that could achieve the desired long range and area denial capability. The first was semi active radar homing guidance, the second was a combined method. In the combined method, radio command guidance is used until the terminal phase, then as the missile gets near the target, it switches to its own radar. This means active radar homing. Let's briefly dive into the basic principles of these two guidance methods. The second phase of missile guidance is needed because the radio command method becomes too imprecise at long range for a hit. So the missile is guided only near to the airspace to the target with this method. Depending on the radar cross-section of the target and diameter of the missile, which determines the size of the onboard radar antenna, the distance can be about 10-30 km. At shorter distances, the radar of the missile can track the target, its guide itself to the target. This was quite an innovative and challenging idea in the early 60s. The competitor of the S-200 system, the missile of the DA system was based on this concept, but it failed and never entered service. The system and related topics are discussed in more detail in the extra content. After that, let's talk about semi-active guidance. The principle of this method is that a continuous radio wave is transmitted, which is reflected from the target. The reflection is detected by the receiver antenna built into the nose of the missile. Based on this, the missile guides itself to the target. Although the missile demands external target illumination, it calculates the steering commands for itself. That's why it's called semi-active, because it requires the target illumination radar on the ground, but it doesn't directly control the missile. The brain is built into the missile. In contrast, the radio command guided missile flies blindly to the direction that is determined by the guidance station. Semi-active guidance significantly influenced the cost of the missile the electronic system was much more complicated compared to radio-controlled missiles. After a short detour, let's get back to the target illumination radar. The required continuous wave radar for the semi-active guidance required a completely new electronic systems and antenna construction. For this reason, the target illuminator radar of the S200 system didn't show any similarities with previous systems, neither externally nor in terms of principle. Not only the basic principle of the missile guidance, but also a fundamental feature of the antenna was a big leap ahead, it received a monopulse receiving antenna. This opened a whole new chapter in the field of electromid jamming protection, but we will get back to this topic later. The active radar homing guidance in terminal phase would have made it possible to create multiple target channel capable system with a single target illuminator radar. With semi-active guidance, a single missile battery still had only a single target channel. An S-200 missile battery can launch and guide missiles against a single target at a time. However, in principle, any number of missiles can be launched at a target, since all guide themselves to the target. In practice, it makes no sense to launch more than 3-4 missiles. If 3 missiles are not enough to make a hit certain, then success cannot be expected from the 4th or 5th missile. The S-200 had many new features compared to the previous generation of SEMS. It was the first Soviet SEM system, which used continuous wave target illumination with a monopulse receiving antenna, like the American Hawk. Moreover, it had a digital computer. The now 50 plus year old computer had a ridiculously low performance compared to today's technology, but it was considered good in its time. The digital computer called Plamia had a 0.064 MHz 60-bit processor 255 bytes of varied ring RAM, 4 KB read-only memory, and 5 executable programs. The use of a digital computer was essential for the new air defense system due to its performing several tasks, but more on that later. For comparison, about two decades later, the Commodore 64 home personal computer, which was manufactured from 1982, 
with a microprocessor operating with a clock signal of 1 MHz, 64 KB of RAM and 20 KB of read-only memory. Even though the digital computer was a big change, the cabins and the control panels and the interiors of the cabins were still of the Soviet standard of the 1950s. They looked very similar to the Berkut, Volkov and Neva. The S200 family represented basically the same era ergonomically regarding the human-machine interface. Finally, let's see the target illumination radar and the fire management cabin. It perfectly met the standards expected by the commander of the Homeland Air Defense. It was roughly 12 meter high, 12 meter wide and 9 meter long perpendicular to the axis of the cabin. The weight of the entire structure was 30 tons. The target illumination radar is the KE-1V, according to the ground code is 5M62. The main parts of the radar are as follows. Continuous wave 4.5 cm wavelength target illumination signal transmit on your antenna. Continuous wave 4.5 cm wavelength target illumination signal receive only antenna. KRO missile flight status downlink signal receive only antenna. NRZ IFF antenna. The target illumination radar operates at a wavelength of 4.5 cm 6.6 GHz. Compared to the pulse radars of the Dvina, Volkhov and Neva, it uses continuous wave transmission. For this reason, there is a separate transmitting and receiving antenna. The basic principle of the pulse radars is they emit a short pulse, then wait for a longer time for the reflection from the target. The system measures the elapsed time, then directly calculates the target distance. The distance is the directly measured parameter, the speed of the target is calculated from the multiple distance measurements. The transmitter of the continuous wave radar transmits a continuous signal, therefore a separate antenna is required for receiving. The system measures only the radial target speed using the Doppler shift of the continuous signal reflected from the target and the bearing change of the target. So directly the speed and bearing of the target is measured and the distance of the target is calculated using the measurements. It is possible to measure the target distance with the target illuminator radar but only with a special operating mode which reduces the range of the radar. More about this later. The power of the transmitter is 3 kW. It is shockingly small value compared to the peak impulse power of the SNR75 of the Volkhov, which is 1000 kW. But in reality, the 3 kW continuous wave means a more powerful beam. More details about this in the extra content. The detection range, as usual, strongly depends on the radar cross-section of the target. A large intercontinental bomber can be tracked from the maximum 500 km range. Against fighters, the tracking range is in their 250 km. For smaller fighters like the Mi-21, it was about only 130 km. The range also depends on the altitude of the target. The Manapus receiver antenna uses the following principle. The continuous wave transmitted signal is the blue color beam in the figure. It is transmitted in a pencil beam from the transmitter antenna. The receiving antenna splits the signal reflected from the target into three receiving beams marked with blue, red and green, two of which form a double pencil beam, the red and green beams. The target tracking system seeks the minimum signal strength for the W beams by maximum for the blue pencil beam. If the target is exactly in the middle, the vertical and horizontal dual beams produce a weak reflection, whereas the main beam will have the maximum. Based on the deviation in this state, the system calculates the azimuth and elevation angle of the target and corrects itself to keep the target in the center of the main beam. For example, if the two red beams have a measured minimum, but the green ones do not, it can be measured which green beam is stronger and using this deviation the angle error can be calculated so the target tracking can be corrected. Because of this, against radars with a monopulse receiving antenna, the angle deception jamming which worked against the SA2 and SA3 family is ineffective. Sending jamming signals to the side lobe of the radar just makes the target tracking more accurate. Using this principle, without any type of scanning, target can be tracked. The SA2 family had to continuously scan with two beams to able to determine the position of the target. The entering and leaving of the target from the beam was measured to determine the angles. The target illuminator radar can transmit with a 1.4 or 0.7 degree wide pencil beam. 
The 1.4 degree mode is used for target acquisition phase against targets closer than 200 km. The 0.7 degree mode is used in target acquisition phase above 200 km and during target tracking. The mode with a narrower beam ensures higher beam power density. See the numerical representation of this effect in the antenna equation in the video about the stealth and the radars. Jamming of the target acquisition radar disrupted the operation of the S200 system more compared to the S75M Volkov because the target illuminator radar uses a very narrow pencil beam similar to the S125 Neva. Therefore, a completely independent target search was almost completely hopeless with the RPC. If the target coordinates are available from the P-14 radar or an external source, the target illuminator radar carries out the target acquisition with a sector or circular target search. In the case of sector search, the RPC performed the search with a left-right scan from lower to higher elevation. Depending on the beam width of the pencil beam, the elevation increases with 1 or 0.5 degrees, the azimut range of the left-right scan is 8 or 4 degrees. With the circular scan, the scan zone is 2.8 by 2.8 degrees or 1.4 by 1.4 degrees. For easier understanding of the size of the scan zone, the moon appears in the sky at an angle of half a degree. The fire control radar of the S75M Volkov with a wide beam mode covers the 7 by 7 degree zone, where both the elevation and azimut data of the target was measured. The RPC covers such area with a sector search following four left-right scans only with the wider pencil beam setting. But this takes some seconds, while the SNR-75 of the Volkov scanned many times during a single second the same area. The only advantage what the Vega has is that the relative angle position change against long-range target is smaller, therefore more time is available for the target acquisition. The target illuminator radar can transmit in three different ways, these have different roles and limitations. MHI mode. This is the primary mode for target tracking. Here the RPC is transmitting a continuous sinusoidal wave. The Doppler shift of the reflected and received signal is measured. With this mode, the target's speed, elevation and azimut parameters are measured. The Plymia digital computer continuously calculates the distance of the target. The transmitted energy is in a very narrow frequency range, therefore the target detection range is in the highest in this mode. If the target's radial speed is less than 40 meters per second, which is 78 knights or 145 km per hour, when a target follows a near tangential path, it cannot be detected or tracked using this mode. FKM Phase Code Manipulation Mode FKM mode of the RPC has the purpose to measure the target range besides the speed, elevation and azimut. In this mode, the transmitted sinusoidal wave is phase modulated by a digital code, which is called Barker code. As the transmitted power has a wider frequency range, the target detection range is shortened than using the MHI mode. If the target's radial speed is less than 60 meters per second, which is 117 knots or 250 km per hour, it cannot be detected using this mode. FM Frequency Modulation Mode FM is a sub-mode of the RPC, it can be used in combination with the MHR or FKM modes. In this mode, the emitted sinusoidal wave is frequency modulated. As the transmitted energy spreads across a wider frequency range, the target detection range is even shorter than in the MHI or in FKM modes. The advantage of using this submode is that the RPC is still able to track a target with zero radial speed when the Doppler shift would otherwise would be zero. This mode is useful against a target which performs in beam maneuver like tactical fighters or strike planes but only at a shorter range. It is also useful against patrolling planes on a racetrack pattern like an AOX. A brief explanation of the operating modes. In the case of monochromatic continuous transmission, in an idealized state, the transmitted signal has a single pure frequency component, so the majority of the radio wave's power is in a very narrow frequency range. Using a sound analogy, we can imagine that a pure frequency component can be heard from only one speaker. This is the MHI mode for the target illuminator radar. In FKM mode, the generated frequency is the same all the time, but the result of the phase change can be seen on the spectrum of the transmitted signal. 
Besides the main frequency component, other frequencies appear, even the modulated bass signal has only a signal frequency component. This means that the power amplitude of the transmission and the reflection in the base frequency range is smaller, therefore the detection range is also smaller. This is the downside of measuring the target distance that the MHI mode is not able to provide. Basically, the S200 engagement process starts with receiving the target coordinates, which can come from an external source via data link. Based on that, the target acquisition is performed by the target illuminator radar. If an external source is not available, the P14F radar provides the bearing and distance of the target. If neither the P14F nor the PRV17 are able to measure the distance of the target, because both are jammed, but the direction of the jamming is known, the target illuminator radar can make an attempt to measure the distance using the FKM mode. The maximum possible measure distance is much smaller compared to the range of the P14 or the PRV17. Following the distance measurement in FKM mode, the RPC is switched back to MHI mode. Following the distance measurement, the digital computer continuously calculates the speed and direction of the target as long as it is able, depending on the radial speed of the target. Knowing the target distance is necessary for selecting the flight profile of the missile and the thrust control, see later. Against the RPC, the previously effective jamming methods simply did not work. The monopulse antenna simply ignored the inlet deception jamming because of its working principle. The principle of the continuous wave target illuminator radar denied the jamming in distance because it measured only the velocity of the target or measured in a different way compared to the pulse radars and only for a short time or once measured. While the Dvina, Volkov and Neva measured the distance and calculated the speed and these did not have monopulse antennas. The Neva had a monopulse antenna but still used pulse fire control radar. Against the S200, a new type of jamming, the velocity gap pull off and fast Doppler targets were needed as new forms of jamming. The target illuminator radar was able to track targets which flew above and fly by the missile battery, the target illumination was not broken. The antennas of the RPC are on hinges with bearings, it could rotate 180 degrees from zero elevation up to 90, then zero degree but into the opposite direction. Well, the basis of design of the S200, its structure, the principle of the target illumination radar and the engagement process has been presented now. The missile variance, the engagement zone, the production and export of the system are topics for another time. If you like the video, you can share, like, subscribe or ring the bell and follow the channel. You can support it via Patreon for exchange for early access video, voting on planned topics and extra content is available and regular updates about the projects. So far 5 extras were released, their description is in the link under the video.